Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of this course, an archive of ideas, a series by the Economic Society SRCC aimed at expanding the horizons of discussions on policy issues. For today's discussion, we have Dr. Indu Bhushan with us. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Ayushman Bharat PMJAY and the National Health uh, and and the National Health Authority Government of India. Sir also received the Global Achievement Award from the prestigious Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Bhushan is a bureaucrat turned economist with a career spanning 35 years across a multitude of sectors. He served for 9 years in the IAS prior to leaving the government service. Thereafter, he worked as senior economist with the World Bank Group. Prior to moving to the Asian Development Bank, it is an honor to have you with us, sir. Today, our discussion will revolve around revamping the health infrastructure in India, a domain in which sir holds first-hand experience. So, before we begin, please note that we will be accepting a few questions as well. So, if there's anything you want to ask. then you can put it in the comment section and we'll take them up now i'd like to hand it over to sir for sharing his insights thank you very much amok and uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be talking to uh, young young uh, colleagues uh, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this and in a brief presentation that i'll make uh, i'll be sharing with you the challenges that india faces in the health sector and some of the things that government is doing to address those challenges and of course uh, we can do much more and uh, we'll look forward to receiving your feedback and suggestions on how india should be uh, re reorienting itself uh, uh, as amog mentioned i am the ceo of ayushman bharat uh, but also recently uh, the national health authority which i had has been given the responsibility of uh, implementing national digital health mission as well so i'll be also uh, taking this opportunity to share with you what we are doing in ayushman bharat and ndhm as we call it so starting with the one of my most favorite quotes uh, of course all inequalities are bad but uh, inequalities which are related to health are almost unacceptable and uh, that's what also dr martin luther king uh, mentioned once uh, now let's look at what india has done so far and uh, i must say that in the health sector we have done some things that we have should be proud of we have uh, got an rid of many communicable diseases um the polio has been uh, out of the history uh, and uh, as uh, i'll show you that uh, Uh, if we look at uh, what we've done to reduce under five mortality, uh, that decline in India, uh, just thirty years ago, nineteen ninety, it was one twenty five. Now it's thirty seven, and a decline of more than seventy percent, and it's much more than uh, what has been achieved globally, which is fifty eight percent. so it has been much more than what uh, uh, globe as a whole the world as a whole has achieved in 1990 uh, the mortality under five mortality in india uh, was much more than global average now actually uh, mortality in india is lower than the global average so a uh, big achievement similarly if you look at maternal maternal mortality ratio uh we have declined we, there's a decline of more than 75% as compared to the global average of 45% again a great achievement and we have been able to reverse the incidence of malaria tb and hiv aids so uh, all this that we can be proud of again uh we have to see what are the challenges still remaining uh so this is a something uh, which is actually very instructive Uh, i'm comparing several countries including the countries uh, some countries which are neighbor and some countries uh, which are competitors uh, uh, 
for example, China, Indonesia, Russia, all the BRICS countries are here. And here, this is India, the orange bar. And of course, uh, we can see uh, that there has been increase of about seven years in terms of uh, life expectancy uh, in about 25 years between 1990 and 1926. Uh, good work. But at the same time, if you look at Bangladesh, which is the blue line, Bangladesh used to be uh, with us about 58 years in 1990, and uh, they have taken over, and they've actually the our path and that of Bangladesh has diverged in the last 25 years. They've done much better. And uh, other thing that you have to see is that we have to catch up. Uh, there's a lot of catch up to be done still, and uh, so we are still way behind many of our other competitors. If you leave behind this uh, this bar, which is uh, South South Africa, and because of many reasons, including uh, some political ones, uh, they have uh, shown a different trajectory. But among all our com competitors or competitors, we are still behind, and we have a lot of catch up to do. Uh, other thing that you I want to share is that uh, in last 25 years, there have been a shift in terms of the disease pattern. Uh, in 1990, majority of burden of disease was that coming from communicable diseases, which is the blue uh, part here. Now that accounts for only one third of the uh, burden of disease. Largely, more than 50% of burden of disease comes from non-communicable diseases. And that has implications actually for the way we provide services, the who needs services, and the financing of services because uh, non-communicable diseases are much more difficult to treat and they provide uh, long-term and sometimes lifetime treatment. So again, uh, we have to see that the burden of disease actually has been changing because of many things including uh, we are living longer, uh, we have done very well uh, in terms of uh, reducing communicable diseases, that's why non-communicable diseases have increased, improved, urbanization, and um, many other things, right? So let's move to uh, other part, that how we're doing in terms of uh, financing services. And this is a graph that provides you at least three information. This is a scatter plot shown between uh, public expenditure on health as percentage of GDP on X uh, axis and uh, total out of expenditure as a share of total health expenditure on Y axis. And uh, you can see that as public expenditure increases, uh, the out of pocket expenditure that people have to spend on health decreases. So there is almost a very nice inverse relationship. Where does India stand? India is right here and you can see two things here. One, that there are very few countries in the world, and I'm saying the world, which are spending less as percent of the GDP as compared to India. Most of them are on the right side. So India is spending one of the lowest amount per capita as percentage of GDP on health. Second thing that you'll notice is that we are very high up here. That means large amount of uh, resources spent on health are coming out of pocket. There are very few countries, all the countries that we want to be compared with, like China, Russia, Brazil, even Vietnam, Indonesia, they are spending more money and the out of pocket expenditure is much lower uh, in these countries. So, Question may be asked, uh, many of you are economists, that why is out-of-pocket expenditure a problem? Because out-of-pocket expenditure is what we do for education mostly. You are studying and uh, you are spending out of your pocket. No one else is paying for most of you. Uh, so why health? Uh, but I must uh, emphasize that health is a special uh, uh, subject, or is not subject, special uh, issue where not everyone needs uh, health care. Only few people who are sick need health care. And those who are sick are already deprived. <clears throat> they are already uh, disadvantaged. So those people 
who are disadvantaged have to pay for themselves and that pushes them into poverty that itself is inequitable so there are more reasons for having lower out of pocket expenditure in health and uh, that's what i would explain one if you have out of pocket expenditure then it dissuades treatment uh, even for uh, rich people when they have to go and spend money themselves they will try to delay it because they would think that maybe it is going to get better on its own uh, it impoverishes people because of course uh, 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 some of the expenditure is not uh, uh, not uh, cheap and at the same time uh, while you are sick you can't earn so uh, it's a double whammy while you are sick you can't earn and you have to spend money and then of course uh, it impedes uh, quality of life or earning but it uh, more importantly or most importantly it disproportionately affects the poor because the same amount actually is a larger uh, larger share of uh, uh, income or disposable income uh, for poor family as compared to the rich and so it in many cases uh, wipes out the poor and there are studies of course there are many uh, estimates but one study particularly says that about 6 crore indians fall below poverty line every year due to catastrophic health expenditure this is of course unacceptable when people fall sick uh, they have only three options one don't have treatment and uh, die of the or suffer the disease or two borrow money and uh, uh, to have the treatment three sell your assets or uh, uh, whatever you have to have treatment so of course all three are not desirable and that's why uh, i'll come, come later uh, that uh, to discuss what we are doing uh, to support uh, uh, this uh, i also want to now focus on the how the quality of services so far i spoke about um, the financing of services how much we spend and where the money comes from and it has implications but also about the quality of services uh, what we found that <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, nice papers uh, 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 and i would recommend that um, uh, if you want to read is from the lancet issue of september uh, 2018 looking at <clears throat> quality uh, of services in um, various countries in south asian countries and it shows that in india uh, and actually it's true for all over that seeking poor quality services actually is much worse than not seeking services at all and we find that about 1.6 million or 16 lakh families or indians die due to poor quality services whereas 2.4 million or 24 lakh uh, people in the country die because of treatable conditions and out of those treatable conditions uh about 16 lakhs are dying because of poor quality of services so quality of services matters and what we find in india is that one of the best hospitals in the world uh we are attracting people from outside for what we call uh refer to as the medical tourism at the same time the quality of services both in public and private hospitals are uneven uh you would find horrible services in some hospitals and uh, uh very good services in some so we need to have system where we can provide uniformly good quality services across the whole ecosystem uh now shifting to the uh the problem that we are seeing now uh and covid uh in last 6 months have highlighted the need for strengthening our public health system uh, what we are seeing is that we need to strengthen our public health infrastructure uh, we also need to expand financial protection for health to cover more people uh, we have covered poor people but that is not all we need to cover actually more than poor people uh, the, there is 
a missing middle that we need to focus on. Uh, uh, rich people or the people at the one end of the uh, uh, spectrum can take care of themselves, but uh, there are people just below that and a lot of people working in the informal sector uh, would require financial protection for health. We also need to intensify infectious disease, disease surveillance and our management programs. Uh, <clears throat> we should not be uh, resting on our laurels about uh, uh, reduce or say getting rid of polio and many other infectious diseases because uh, this uh, fight against communicable diseases will continue and new viruses will keep coming up and we need to intensify our surveillance and management programs. Uh, four things that we need to digitize healthcare and strength in telemedicine and that has come uh, as a quite a uh, strong message from the ongoing uh, pandemic. And finally, there is a need for deepening our regional cooperation among countries for sharing information, sharing information uh, on time and sharing information fully. I think that kind of a compact between countries uh, across the world is needed and that comes out very clearly uh, from this pandemic. Now, moving to summarize what we see in the health sector right now and I'm making very strong statements. Right now, our financing of healthcare is inadequate, inefficient and inequitable. I'm saying inadequate, as I mentioned, the government budget is only about 1.2 to 1.45 percent of GDP. We need to be spending much more. We need to be spending much more for improving <clears throat> curative care, but at the same time, we need to be spending more for improving public health programs. We need to we take any indicator uh, in the health in terms of doctors per capita, number of beds per capita. Uh, we have a long way to go before we meet WHO standards. Therefore, there is a need for massive investment in the health sector. Uh, current spending is not going to be <coughs> sufficient. Our spending is also inefficient. Uh, what we see is that uh, the uh, we uh, the regulations uh, are weak. Uh, the private sector is not uh, very efficiently and effectively uh, regulated. Uh, whatever we spend through public sector uh, not does not uniformly lead to quality services, and that needs to be managed much better. So the money that we uh, spend, I'm not sure, or I'm sure uh, we can get better bang out of this buck uh, by being more efficient and more effectively uh, investing this money. And finally, uh, we believe, or I, I, I believe in data is there, that our, our health financing is inequitable. Uh, it is inequitable in terms of uh, when I mentioned that you don't have enough doctors, but most of these doctors are also uh, concentrated in larger cities. And if you go to tier two, tier three cities, rural areas, uh, number of doctors per capita are much less there. In terms of availability of services, especially tertiary level services, uh, they are not available in rural areas and uh, many of the tier two, tier three cities. At the same time, a uh, lot of people, uh, uh, poor people can't afford services and many people uh, fall into poverty because of uh, uh, expenditure on health. So in that sense, our financing is also uh, inequitable. So now, what do we do about it? <clears throat> and I'll <clears throat> discuss two schemes and that we have, uh, which are going to be addressing some of the issues I have raised. First one is Ayushman Bharat. And Ayushman Bharat, uh, when we people talk about it, uh, I think some people don't know that it has two legs. It first leg is support for comprehensive primary health care uh, by establishing more than 150,000 health and wellness centers. And these health and wellness centers are supposed to be strengthening our preventive, promotive and primary health care. And uh, they will uh, provide first level of treatment uh, to many of our country people. 
Uh, the second leg is provision of secondary and tertiary inpatient care through uh, hospitals, both public and private uh, sector hospitals. And the second leg is also called PMJ, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. And I look after that leg of uh, Maayushman Bharat. The first leg of uh, health and wellness centers uh, is managed by the Ministry of Health directly. So uh, let me give you some information about the PMJ. PMJ, uh, as I mentioned, is a program to cover uh, more than 50 crore people uh, of what uh, more than 10 uh, crore families. Uh, and uh, this is to support uh, them for inpatient care whenever they get sick and are hospitalized. Uh, so we cover them up to 5 lakhs uh, per family per year and for most of the serious illnesses. Uh, one critical thing about it is the portability of benefits. Uh, you can come from Bihar and Bihar will pay for it. But <clears throat> even if you are sick, uh, in uh, working in the Mumbai, you can use services in Mumbai in any of the impaneled hospitals. If you don't have services, say, in your hometown and you want to go out and use services, that is also feasible. So your benefits are portable. And one good thing is that there is no cap on family size, age, gender on the scheme also covers all the pre-existing conditions. <clears throat> For uh, implementing this scheme, uh, one thing we have done, uh, and uh, this uh, may be of interest to you, that it's a very complex scheme as you can understand. We are looking at more than 50 crore beneficiaries and we have more than uh, about 23,000 hospitals who are impaneled and we have 32 states and UTs who are implementing this scheme. So implementing this scheme uh, is a huge challenge in terms of identifying beneficiaries, ensuring that what they're getting from the hospital is right treatment, paying the hospitals and seeking feedback from beneficiaries. And all that has been possible uh, because of a very strong IT platform that we have created, uh, which provides end-to-end -end support to beneficiaries uh, in a paperless manner and uh, cashless manner <clears throat> because payments all payments are done online and of course all this is supported through a uh, ecosystem which has been developed through uh, the guidelines benefit package guidelines uh, quality assurance mechanism fraud prevention mechanism a very strong monitoring and evaluation uh, capacity building both at national state and district level uh, ensuring smooth financial flows uh, awareness generation, call centers, and grievance uh, redressal. Now, when we started the scheme, uh, many states already had some uh, similar schemes. So we have actually given a lot of flexibility to states in terms of how they want to implement the scheme. Some states are using what we call trust mode. Uh, they have created trust uh, at our society at the state level, which is providing uh, uh, payment to hospitals. Some uh, states are following insurance mode. Uh, they have hired insurance company, <coughs> which is providing uh, assistance or uh, payment to the uh, to uh, hospitals. And some uh, states are following what we call mixed mode, up to. Uh, certain level it's an insurance company and when it goes beyond that level uh, it is the uh, trust that pays uh, four states have not joined so far uh, these are west bengal telangana uh, orissa and delhi and delhi we are hoping will join soon they have in principle agreed and other three also we hope will join soon because as far as we are concerned it is a win-win situation and uh, no one is losing by joining the scheme actually everyone will gain so we hope uh, that uh, these states who are out of uh, Ayushman Bharat uh, will join soon <clears throat> so some other thing that I would like to share is that you know this is a, a one scheme but it has actually created a lot of revolution uh, across uh, the country um, many states have used uh, this scheme as a fulcrum as a uh, as a basis on which they've expanded the benefits and they've covered more people. 
uh, I was earlier talking about missing middle. Uh, many states have actually gone almost uh, uh, covered the entire population uh, using the framework that was provided by PMJ and uh, IT system that we provided uh, the ecosystem that we have uh, developed. So the, here the orange color shows PMJ, uh, but on top of this orange color, you would find that uh, this green uh, color is the number of beneficiaries. Uh, those have been added by states using their own money to cover more people. So uh, this scheme uh, has benefited actually many more than what we had intended to uh, because uh, uh, states are using their own money to uh, cover more people. So currently, instead of more than 10 crore families, more than 13 crore families are getting the benefit. Now, let me give you some uh, hard numbers about uh, what we've done in PMJ so far. Uh, before I just uh, briefly touch on NDHM, National Digital Health Mission. Uh, so, this scheme was started and launched by Honorable Prime Minister on 23rd September 2018. So, in about a month's time, one month and a half, uh, we will complete um, uh, two, two years. And so far, uh, more than one crore, actually 1.15 crores, 1 crore and 15 lakh uh, treatments uh, have been given. We've given, we've given more than uh, 12 crore cards to individual beneficiaries. Uh, more than 22, actually close to 23,000 hospitals uh, have been impaneled. And a strong momentum actually has been created. More hospitals are coming on board every day. Uh, we are distributing more cards every day. And uh, right now, we are providing more than 1 lakh treatments uh, every week. And uh, before the lockdown, uh, this number was close to uh, 1.8 lakhs. And we are hoping that uh, slowly uh, we will reach uh, that. And uh, if you normalize it, I think uh, we will be able to provide more than 1 crore treatment every year. So, as I mentioned, that uh, 23, more than uh, 23,000 uh, hospitals are impaneled. And uh, out of these, more than 10,000 hospitals are private hospitals. And one important thing is that in, during the lockdown period, we impaneled more than 2,000 hospitals. And that was necessary because many hospitals had converted into COVID-only hospitals. And we needed more uh, or, uh, sources or uh, provider of uh, services and uh, we needed more uh, uh, hospitals and uh, that's why we uh, added more hospitals but also uh, the need was more and uh, we needed uh, uh, more uh, people to be treated and that's why there was a drive uh, through which we um, got more hospital impaneled and as I <coughs> mentioned that uh, every day more hospitals are joining uh, PMJ uh, I mentioned about uh, portability and uh, portability has been a critical feature. More than uh, 1.2 lakh people have got treatment outside their states and major beneficiaries of uh, portability have been Madhya Pradesh, UP, Bihar uh, and Jharkhand where services uh, are uh, uh, they are underserved as far as service uh, delivery uh, provisions are concerned. So you know, about 1.2 crore treatments have been given and they uh, would cost about 1,500, 15,000 crores. And um, uh, two thirds of those that money has been spent in private sector. So as you can see that private sector has played a major role, although in terms of uh, impanelment, only 45% uh, uh, hospitals are private, but in terms of provision of services, They've used uh, about two thirds of the resources <clears throat> and they're mostly providing actually uh, tertiary care. And uh, as far as tertiary care is concerned, most of this tertiary care is coming from private hospitals. And a large amount of large proportion of portability um, is also coming from uh, private uh, hospitals. Uh, we find that uh, PMJ has been a crucible for innovation. Uh, we have done many things that uh, are new 
uh, and have been done for the first time uh, in a major scheme like this. One was that seamless portability of services across the country. People don't have to you know, uh, take anything just themselves and maybe <coughs> memorize the Aadhaar card and uh, they can get services um, across uh, the country without any uh, problem. Uh, we have been able to create this uh, strong IT platform which is providing end-to-end -end paperless and cashless uh, uh, services. We also have very strong data analytics uh, and uh, this is a scheme where from first day we've had uh, uh, very strong uh, uh, dashboard to give you up-to-date live information about who's taking treatment, where they're taking treatment, what kind of services are being used, who is using that, uh, uh, those services and who is providing those services. Similarly, we are using uh, advanced uh, data analytics for uh, fraud and abuse control and creating triggers when we find some suspicion, suspicious uh, transmission. We've also uh, been working this in a very cooperative federalism, um, uh, following a co cooperative federalism approach and philosophy and uh, given a lot of flexibility in terms of implementation uh, to states, uh, which is also uh, one key feature. And last thing that I already referred to is that there has been a lot of integration. Many existing schemes have come together uh, under this uh, Ayushman Bharat. And uh, our aim is that at one point in time, probably all government schemes, including many of the schemes for uh, civil servants and uh, government employees will also converge with this and provide uh, we'll have one scheme uh, one nation in terms of uh, health financing uh, also uh, while i said that this scheme is there for providing financial protection uh, to people but it is doing much more than that we are empowering beneficiaries now poor people have option of going to public sector private sector within private sector they can choose hospital a or b based on where they think the uh, best uh, services will be available and this is and they can demand services because they are uh, paying for those services through us uh, we are also indirectly <clears throat> increasing the availability of services because especially in tier 2 tier 3 cities where earlier there was not much demand now the demand has been created and we are seeing that that creation of demand also has led to uh, increased supply of services and uh, we uh, hope uh, that this will help in terms of uh, attracting a lot of uh, hospital chains and uh, entrepreneurs to create and invest more uh, health facilities in rural areas to tier two tier three cities because of the increased demand third we are ensuring quality of services since we are paying for services we can also demand uh, quality and we are creating standard treatment protocols for each uh, health uh, condition, uh, what kind of services should be provided, what kind of uh, diagnostic should be done, what kind of treatment should be done, how long the patient should stay. And so uh, through that, uh, we're ensuring that people are getting good quality services. We are also controlling cost because uh, we are now a big purchaser of services. We are providing uh, purchasing services for more than 50 crore people and through that we have said uh, we can control cost uh, through collective bargaining uh, with the uh, healthcare providers and uh, uh, providers of pharmaceuticals and uh, devices. We've been uh, undertaking a lot of innovations uh, and that is uh, helping the entire uh, health uh, sector ecosystem. Uh, we are also working uh, very closely with the Ministry of Health to improve the continuum of care, uh, which is to link primary health care better with secondary and tertiary, improving the referral system. Uh, also, uh, we are creating an ecosystem for health insurance, uh, which is uh, for the first time a large number of uh, people uh, have been included and supported through health insurance. Uh, that strengthening of health insurance ecosystem will help in terms of also uh, covering uh, missing middle and even the rich people. And finally, uh, PMJ has been providing building blocks for national digital health mission because of our strong 
uh, IT platform. And I would like to say something about this national digital uh, health mission, uh, which has been announced uh, recently about two months ago. And uh, the responsibility of rolling out national digital health mission was given to NHA. So the vision of national digital health mission, and these are a couple of last slides after which I'll uh, stop and uh, uh, take questions, is to support UHC universal health coverage in an efficient, accessible, inclusive, affordable, and timely and safe manner. So basically, uh, this mission is to support and deepen uh, universal arts, our request for universal health coverage. Uh, it will provide data, information, and infrastructure services. Uh, the one of the some uh, key driving principles are open uh, systems, uh, interoperability, uh, and standard-based uh, digital systems. And uh, we have to ensure in this uh, system that we we'll ensure security, privacy, confidentiality uh, of the, the, the data will be uh, based. The sharing of any data will be based on consent. And uh, uh, so we are uh, following privacy and security by design uh, in creation of this uh, national digital health ecosystem. So what are the objectives of this? Uh, one is to, of course, establish the uh, established state of the art uh, digital health system and managing uh, health data. Uh, we intend to improve the quality of uh, health data collection, storage, dis dissemination and sharing. Uh, we want to provide platform for interoperability of uh, healthcare data. Uh, many of the countries which have started uh, uh, going through this uh, digital health revolution are now finding that uh, much of their data is not interoperable because different uh, systems, uh, different parts uh, of the country are following different standards. Therefore, uh, the, the data can't be taken from, say, one hospital to other hospital. But we are ensuring in this mission that everyone follows the same standards so that uh, data could be carried. We are also fast-tracking health registries. We are creating registries for all individuals. We are creating registries for all doctors and also all uh, health facilities, including labs and uh, pharmacies, uh, uh, diagnostic centers, and of course, hospitals. And uh, if uh, all that is actually done well, we believe that it will improve the quality of care. Uh, it will help in terms of uh, having better evidence making, uh, evidence based policy making, and ultimately support sustainable development goals. Finally, just uh, uh, to tell you the key building blocks of uh, NDHM. Uh, we have four key building blocks. One is that we want to provide uh, unique health ID to everyone so that that health ID can be linked to their records. Uh, second, all the healthcare providers, including uh, modern medicine doctors and doctors from other uh, areas, Ayush doctors, uh, can be registered uh, so that uh, they have <clears throat> the facility of e-sign and e-prescription but also uh, they can be tracked uh, by uh, patients uh, and we can confirm that they are real doctors. Uh, third is uh, all health facilities, uh, including uh, hospitals, should be registered and we are creating that registry. And of course, uh, these registries will not help unless we have uh, uh, created all these digital health records uh, for everyone uh, or digitize the health records of everyone which are linked to their unique health IDs. And they can be shared <coughs> through a consent manager in a, um, in a secure uh, way at the, at the consent uh, of uh, uh, individual. So these are the four key modules that we are preparing right now and hope to launch uh, within this month. And at some later stage, We'll also be working on telemedicine and e-pharmacy, uh, but uh, that will take some time. Uh, but the first uh, phase will be to support these four building blocks and uh, improve uh, access to information, improve quality of information, improve uh, quality of uh, treatment uh, through this uh, in, the, in the sector. So these were the two uh, major issues that uh, we've been working with, uh, which we believe will help in terms of actually revolutionizing 
uh, the healthcare uh, in the country. And uh, with that, I finished my uh, presentation uh, with this quote that I really like. It's an African word that which says that if you want to go fast, go alone. Uh, because if you are with people, well, it's very difficult to go fast because you are your speed is determined by the weakest or the slowest person in the group. But if you want to go far, then go together because you need different kind of people to deal with different kind of conditions. And uh, you need uh, to have a support of a lot of people uh, if you have to sustain a long, long journey. And here, uh, supporting or strengthening healthcare is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And here, we need to work together, uh, policy makers, uh, healthcare providers, health facilities, and uh, general public, uh, if you want to improve uh, healthcare uh, in the country. And I look forward to uh, working with the, many of the stakeholders, but at this stage, uh, I finish uh, my presentation and look forward to uh, responding to or trying to respond to uh, any questions or uh, any suggestions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much again. Thank you, sir. It was really enriching and insightful. Uh, now, moving on to some questions. Anushruti ma'am, a professor at SRCC asks, in the graphs you shared, Bangladesh has better health outcomes than India despite lower per capita incomes and per capita public spending on health. What could be the reason? Are there any learning experience for learning experiences for India from the Bangladesh story? <clears throat> Absolutely, I think uh, uh, we have to see. Sorry, uh, <clears throat> they must be doing something really right or something really different uh, as compared to uh, us. Uh, just to. Maybe I'm taking a digression because as a doctoral student, uh, once I had done this uh, analysis of uh, um, provision of uh, reproductive health services, uh, and I'd shared, uh, I was shared, uh, I was trying to compare Bangladesh and West Bengal and uh, uh, to see uh, what is the... Uh, uh, happened in these uh, because they, they culturally very differ, very very similar, and of course uh, before partition uh, they were part of the same country. Uh, and I found that uh, uh, in terms of uh, number of children they uh, would like to have, number of uh, women who are using contraceptives, a uh, number of uh, women who are uh, going for uh, antenatal checkups, a uh, number of women who are going for uh, uh, institutional deliveries. Bangladesh actually was doing much better uh, as compared to India, uh, whereas uh, uh, in terms of GDP and per capita income, uh, India was far ahead. And also in terms of actually investment in health. And uh, to me, uh, the, the, uh, what uh, uh, came out of that uh, study was that uh, the focus and the efficiency of services and the intensity of services and uh, the reach of those services, especially in rural areas, uh, was uh, much better uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, uh, an observation that uh, I think it was, my study was more anecdotal. It didn't have uh, more rigorous uh, uh, research uh, methodology that I followed. Uh, but here uh, we see these numbers uh, very clearly. Uh, that uh, Bangladesh, in terms of increasing uh, life expectancy, has done much better than in India. They are uh, investing um, lower amount of resources uh, and they are actually poorer. So obviously, uh, they are doing something which is different and uh, maybe the efficiency of uh, using the money uh, is uh, much uh, better. Uh, they have been able to find uh, uh, the package of services uh, which are providing greater payoff uh, uh, for them. And I think uh, this is something uh, maybe, um, uh, of course, uh, researchers uh, in the country um, uh, should be looking at uh, that why is that uh, they have done better and uh, 
what can we learn from uh, uh, Bangladesh? Uh, and maybe some of these things are replicable. Some of these things may be cultural, uh, which we can't replicate. But I'm sure there would be things uh, that we can uh, uh, understand and uh, replicate. But if you look at India itself, uh, India looks like a, a different parts of the country uh, mirror uh, different parts of the world. If you uh, look at, uh, pick up any country or any state in South, especially Kerala, uh, they are much closer to what actually Vietnam and Cambodia, Vietnam or Thailand have achieved in terms of healthcare. But if you go to Bihar, they are much closer to uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of their health uh, uh, health outcomes. And uh, so we don't need to go to Bangladesh and compare themselves. I think uh, within the country itself, we can find uh, several states where we can compare and see how uh, well some states have done. At the same time, some states uh, need to improve uh, and uh, be more uh, uh, provide more resources, but uh, use uh, more importantly those resources much uh, much more effectively and efficiently. Indeed, sir. Uh, uh, on, on the similar lines of uh, uh, idea of norms. Uh, Aradhya Daga asks, uh, uh, how can we address the social norms surrounding healthcare in rural areas, wherein some people have claimed they uh, they uh, they looked down they are looked down upon for using so-called modern medication, leaving behind the tradition. So, <clears throat> if I understand the question uh, uh, the question is uh, that in rural areas if they use modern medicine they uh, are looked down upon because they think that uh, uh, traditional medicine is uh, much more effective right sir you know uh, i like my own personal view and this is a personal view uh, that all systems of medicine uh, have a strong, uh, strong reason to exist, and all systems of uh, medicine have been there, especially traditional medicine, have been there for a long time, and have, they have been there for a long time because they, people have found a lot of uh, uh, benefit uh, from uh, those traditional medicines. But one problem with traditional medicine has been uh, that many of the things that uh, we prescribe uh, doesn't have evidence base. Uh, and for whatever uh, part of the medicine the evidence base has come, I think uh, uh, the um, uh, adoption all over the world uh, has been phenomenal. And I give example of yoga. Uh, now yoga has been, uh, has been uh, researched, researched very well. And it shows that many of the asanas of yoga uh, can reduce, uh, um, uh, like, uh, are helpful in uh, uh, supporting or strengthening or addressing uh, many uh, non-communicable diseases. And because of this uh, uh, evidence-based, uh, the popularity of yoga is across the world. Uh, it doesn't go by religion. It doesn't go by uh, whether developed country, developing countries. Uh, it is uh, all over the world. And whenever, similarly, uh, other parts of uh, uh, Ayurveda, uh, whenever some uh, evidence uh, comes out that it's uh, uh, through, uh, through uh, research, uh, those things become uh, uh, really popular and uh, uh, become uh, widely used. And uh, this evidence base has to come through uh, what the gold standard is in uh, uh, health research, uh, randomized control trials. And so we need to have much more of that for uh, traditional medicine so that we can establish them uh, as uh, uh, effective uh, uh, interventions uh, and provide resources and support for uh, those uh, uh, form of medicine. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that kind of research has not been done for all 
uh, forms of uh, medicine and within each form not for all uh, kinds of intervention and uh, it may be uh, that many of those interventions are not effective and uh, they are more like a placebo and provide um, uh, not a real treatment but uh, just a uh, 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 just uh, what we call a placebo effect so uh, again um, in terms of what works what does not work there should be a, a scientific basis for that as far as uh, rural uh, india is concerned there is a strong um, support for traditional medicine and uh, as as policy makers uh, we should uh, strengthen uh, the evidence base uh, for effectiveness of uh, traditional medicine and promote uh, those interventions which we believe uh, are effective uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> but uh, my own experience has been that in rural areas uh, modern medicine also uh, is uh, looked uh, uh, like uh, people don't use modern medicine uh, many times because they can't afford it it's not because they uh, don't uh, uh, like modern medicine uh, so i think uh, in terms of ensuring the uh, <clears throat> affordability of modern medicine of course policy makers have a role to play and uh, my scheme uh, that i support or coordinate uh, pmj uh, help in doing that we are also exploring the uh, uh, the idea that the uh, pmj should also support uh, ayush uh, packages and uh, hopefully uh, before too soon uh, we'll have a view on that uh very true sir uh sir uh, if it's possible could you just uh, turn your video on oh my video is not on sorry yes sir <coughs> all right sir uh, moving on to the next question uh, abha sharma asks hmm. how to expand tertiary medical education uh, capacity in future to bring down cutoffs and costs and to stop brain drain in medical sector Hmm. You know, <clears throat> uh, the government actually has been doing a uh, uh, taking a lot of uh, steps to increase uh, uh, supply of doctors, increase uh, supply of qualified and uh, specialized or uh, specialists uh, uh, in the country. Uh, there is uh, when I was growing up, uh, which was uh, uh, about one generation ago, as compared to you guys. um there was only one aims in the whole country now there are 13 aims uh, actually more uh, across the country creating and supporting uh, uh, creation of uh, uh, specialists similarly uh, the number of uh, medical colleges have mushroomed and uh, there is a policy that every house, every district uh, should have a medical college and that was unthinkable i come from up and in up <clears throat> when i was growing up there were four or five medical colleges now think of uh, having more than 75 medical colleges plus a lot of private medical colleges i think uh, um, is uh, something uh, that uh, public policy uh, has done but also at the same time we have to be careful uh, that uh, uh, creation or developing a specialist takes time if you uh, open one medical college today um, it will take at least 7 8 years before you will start to get any pay off from this medical college because uh, it's uh, that long it takes to train a doctor but it's not only the doctor that we need we are actually uh, right now lacking it is the paramedical staff nurses uh, and other supporting uh, human resources uh, that is in short supply as well and we need to uh, be strengthening that uh, right now the number of surgeries that we have to or we should be doing number of people that we need to be supporting through chemotherapy or cancer care are much more than our capacity to uh, cater to them and uh, one of the major constraint has been uh, human resources uh, but i'm firmly i firmly believe that with the government's the recent policies on expanding the number of medical colleges expanding uh, number of uh, super uh, specialized uh, 
uh, organization like AIMS, uh, we will should be in next five to ten years uh, be self sufficient. And if that happens, I think we can be we can also uh, export uh, human resources. And I don't actually call it uh, brain drain. It's the more uh, brain gain uh, if people go uh, and leave country and go and uh, have a better exposure outside, learn even more uh, through new te- techniques, technology outside, and come back and uh, uh, come come back and contribute to the country. Uh, I was out of the country for 25 years, and uh, I came back, and I've been working for the last two and a half years, and hope to continue to contribute uh, uh, to building uh, the health sector in the country for coming coming years. So uh, I think uh, uh, we should see it as a more uh, uh, holistic uh, uh, global uh, uh, global sector where uh, going for some time and coming back I think should be uh, should be encouraged rather than look down upon. Sure, sir. Uh, so, uh, sir, one o'clock. <laughs> so, we'll take one last question. Sure. Uh, sir, you talked about uh, massive increase in health infrastructure spending Mm. with efficiency uh how will the uh, financial burden be shared between the central and state government uh, given that the public health is a subject even uh, states have legislative uh, legislative power on uh, on the matter uh, and even if we increase inputs uh, how do we take care of implementation failure and the quality of care at the levels of local government well (laughs) very uh, good question and a very complex question. You're right. Uh, health is a state subject in our constitution. Uh, as you might know that constitution has three lists. One is state list, one is central list, one is concurrent list. And uh, all the topics in state list are supposed to be led by state. And health is a state subject. It's in the list uh, which has state subjects. Uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, current pandemic, it's very clear uh, that uh, even if, even though health is a state subject, um, health itself is uh, a national concern in many ways. In in, in some on some issues, uh, communicable diseases uh, they travel uh, across states, and uh, uh, so also uh, medical education, of course. Uh, uh, medical education actually is in concurrent uh, uh, list, uh, so uh, that's uh, not a problem. Uh, but uh, public health uh, cannot uh, see the uh, uh, state boundaries. I think uh, uh, it has to cut across uh, state boundaries. And uh, there is a move. There is a hopefully a move, and there's a hopefully we'll see that change. Um, in the status of health and hopefully it will uh, become at least the concurrent subject uh, as uh, education is. Uh, but uh, that is not the question that you asked. The question was that how state and uh, uh, center should uh, share resources. Uh, so right now in uh, most of the schemes, the sharing uh, which are uh, implemented by the government of India, the sharing is usually 60%, 40%. 60% comes from the state government of India and 40% comes from the states. And uh, in terms of implementation, largely it's the uh, uh, it's, um, uh, role of states and uh, a role of uh, government of India is largely to uh, define um, guidelines and uh, uh, protocols and uh, uh, just coordination between states. Uh, but the implementation is done by states. And what we see is that there is a huge variance across states in terms of their capacity and uh, uh, sometimes resources that they put in uh, uh, for health sector. And uh, that's where the problem is. And uh, earlier I was talking about uh, uh, variance uh, in terms of health outcomes across states uh, in the country. And some of this is related to uh, the resources that states are putting in and uh, many of the states uh, which are not doing well actually are putting uh, uh, much uh, lower uh, resources of their own uh, in the health sector and uh, some of them also have uh, poorer 
implementation capacity which needs to be uh, improved. Uh, again, uh, this is a, a long haul. Here, states actually have to learn from each other and see what works, what doesn't work, and uh, how they can improve their implementation. And uh, center uh, on their uh, on their part can also help in terms of that knowledge sharing and ensuring that people or states uh, uh, who need support are provided support uh, and uh, we facilitate or catalyze that kind of learning. So thank Curious. you. Mark. And thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, well, so that really offers us tremendous insights into how we can sort of reimagine the state of healthcare of our country. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have a conversation and learn from someone with your experience. We are grateful to you for uh, imparting knowledge to the entire student community. Uh, I also thank everyone who joined us in this session. Uh, this will re continue to remain on our YouTube page. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.